Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Fort Worth. Thank you for joining us. Here are this week's announcements. Grace Connection meets every third Sunday of the month after second service. If you are at least 50 years old, please join us for a wonderful time of fellowship as we strengthen and encourage one another in the Lord. A potluck lunch will be provided, so please bring a dish to share. For more information, email Kent and Stephanie Thomas at seniors at loveneverfails.com. Haltom Christian School is seeking servants for their new ministry, Helping Hands. Volunteers will help set up classrooms after services on Wednesdays and Sundays. This is a great opportunity to get involved in LNFI's local work. An interest meeting will be held after second service, Sunday, August 21st in the library. For more information, contact Heather at office at haltomchristianschool.com. The women of Calvary from preteen all the way up to retired are welcome to attend Mary and Martha at His Feet Fellowship. This is a summer only study and potluck fellowship where the ladies will encourage, admonish, and spur each other on to good works as women in the body of Christ. They meet on the fourth Sunday of every month after the second service. Visit the app or website to sign up to bring a dish. Hope to see you there. The last Wednesday night of the month, in remembrance of Christ Jesus and His work upon the cross, we celebrate communion. Come join us in obedience to the Lord for this intimate time of worship, teaching, and prayer. First Friday Men's Breakfast is an opportunity to build relationships with brothers in Christ that go beyond saying hello on Sunday morning. They meet on the first Friday of every month at 7.30 a.m. To attend, simply fill out an RSVP form on the CCFW website or email Jeff at firstfriday at loveneverfails.com. Heart to Heart invites married or soon to be engaged couples to join them for their first study on Pastor Greg Laurie's book, Married Happily. Discover what the Bible says about key issues married couples face, such as effective communication, in-laws, resolving conflict, the unique roles of husband and wife, and much more. Their first study will be Saturday, September 3rd in the Koinonia Cafe at 6 p.m. Child care is available, but you must register in advance. For more info, contact Mario and Rhonda at hearttoheart at loveneverfails.com. High school students are invited to join us for Youth Camp 2022. Pack up for a weekend of fun and fellowship October 7th through the 9th as we travel to Georgetown to spend time camping out in God's creation. Bring your Bible as we will be studying what it means to be made in God's image. Sign up by September 7th to guarantee your spot. Space is limited. You can register by filling out the form on the CCFW website or by speaking with Raul or Cisco after service. If you have any questions, there will be a brief informational meeting for parents after service, September 4th in the barn. The Praise and Worship team is currently looking for a talented piano player. If you have experience playing piano, please email jesse at jesse at loveneverfails.com. Thank you for your attention and for silencing your phones. Remember, you can get more info regarding any ministry and view all of our upcoming events by visiting our website or on the Calvary Chapel Fort Worth app. Have a wonderful day and remember, love never fails.
devoted to us. We worship you. We praise you this morning.
Well, church, you may be seated now as we worship the Lord this morning with our tithes and offerings. Just really give them our hearts this morning.
bless you. Of course, if you're visiting with us, you know, today is what we call the third Sunday or Love Never Fails Sunday. And it's a day that we take up an offering, guys, for the orphanage there in Camargo. So the Lord bless you as you give this morning. You know, if you want to find out more about uh, the things that we do at, uh, at the orphanage and our local work uh, here at Halter Christian School or in Camargo or orphanage, just go to lnfi.org or you can go to the Calvary website. And the Lord bless you. Let me ask you a question as I welcome you again this morning, those that are tuning in live as well. Have you noticed a progression in the videos up to this point? Yes. Amen. Yesterday, or I can't remember what day it was. Maybe it was yesterday or maybe it was the day before. It doesn't rem Friday. When I reviewed the video, I sit here and, and they play and I, I get to watch it ahead of time. And I, note, I said uh, to Abby, she's the one who puts all that together. I said, did you notice that the children each time we see the video, they're, they're more joyous, more, jo amen? 
And that's, you know why? That's because of what you're doing right now and because of the great labor that Steve and Carol, that they're doing with those children. They have a home. They have a family. They know they're loved, and they know that Steve and Carol, they're not going to leave. They're there to help them. Amen? So thank the Lord for that. Hey, that's, I thank God for that. Man. So the Lord bless you this morning, and thank you for giving. And listen, uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer, two things quickly. Uh, Pastor Thomas, of course, will be back Wednesday here. Uh, we, uh, the servant leadership training is over, so we resume to normal. But I have great news uh, from the tent ministry, as always. Listen to what happened yesterday. I received this text as I was preparing this sermon. said, uh, Bill, listen, I just heard that Lisa, Angelica, Freddie, Eddie, Stephanie just received Jesus Christ at their, as their Lord and Savior at the Williams Tent. That, you know, listen, six people came to Christ yesterday. Well, we need tents all over this city. Amen. Oh, pray about being a part of that. You know, I'm so thankful that more people are stepping out, and, and you just never know what God is going to do. Amen? So with all that being said this morning, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy. We're going to begin in chapter 2 this morning. A transition takes place, of course, uh, with chapter 2. And uh, with all that being said, let's go now to the Lord in prayer. Father, <clears throat> we thank you. Uh, Lord, first of all, I thank you that I'll not have any allergy attacks like I did in the first service. Lord, please let my voice and my throat just be perfect just for the next however long you want me to teach. Just let it after that, Lord, do whatever. It's okay, but just give me that break. And Lord, we thank you for those who've given this morning to help the work that we do there. And Lord God, I'm so thankful for Steve and Carol. I'm so thankful for the children that they love. I'm so thankful, Lord, that there's a place if they are safe, they are well fed, they're cared for medically, and Lord, they're learning about you, our Savior. Now, Father, I pray this morning, somehow as you always do, would you help me just to teach faithfully and accurately? All those that are listening live, those that are in the chapel here, maybe they're listening by radio, they're in their car right now. Lord, wherever they might be, I pray that the Word of God penetrates their heart and their mind. And may every need, Lord, I know none of them, but may every need be met in the, in the hearts of your sheep this morning. We love you, we praise you in Jesus' name. And the church says... Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about the power of grace. Say that with me, the power of grace. Whenever you think of grace, it's easy to, you know, you know that grace, of course, we're saved by grace and uh, justified and sanctified and uh, all of the glorified one day, all those things. But do you ever think that grace is more than just pardon, that grace is power? And grace is power. This morning, we're going to look at that like never before, I hope. And I hope that we never forget the words this morning. Remember that Second Timothy, this is the last, well, we could call it the last will and the last testament or the last epistle letter of the greatest apostle that ever lived. And so he is writing to his son, his spiritual son in the faith, Timothy. Eighty-three verses, and they're all to me some of the greatest penmanship from the power of the Holy Spirit in God's Word. Remember that Paul is writing from Rome. He is in the Mamertine prison all the way down into the dungeon where the sewer is. There's that gigantic hole overhead that allows the light to come through so he can see during the day and then also the air circulation because of the stench that is present. With all that being said, Paul knows that his departure is at hand. He understands. He, he's passing the torch now, if you will, on, the baton on to Timothy. And he knows that, that, uh, uh, that Nero soon will be executing him. Now, with all of that being said this morning, let's begin as, and look at the power of grace uh, there in verse 1. When Paul says unto Timothy, he says, You therefore, my son, be strong in your own strength. No. Be strong in the what? 
That's a great word. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now listen carefully. Whenever Paul uses the word you there, it's not it's emphatic. It's not plural, like written to the whole church. He's speaking directly now to the heart of Timothy. And, and he knows what he's about to face. And he says, Timothy, listen. He says, you have a responsibility now. You, I'm passing everything over to you. You have been with me for probably had been with Paul now for 20 years. And there Paul writing to him. He's in chains. And he says, Timothy, to you personally, listen carefully. He, and he uses the word therefore. He goes back then to chapter 1 from last Sunday, uh, verse 15, when Paul is mentioning to him all those that have turned away from him, that he's all alone. And he says, Timothy, you now, I'm, I'm giving you the deposit. I'm entrusting to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are to guard that. And you're also to join with me in the suffering for the gospel. And then he says something. There's only one way that you can do it. And, and there's only one way to be strong with the things that you're being called to now. And that is in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a command. A command where he says, listen, Timothy, you've got to be strong. But listen carefully now. It's not outer strength that he's talking about. He's talking, literally it would read in the Greek, be strong or be empowered within Timothy. And the resource that he needs for this strength to do the job he's called to do and for us to do the job we've been called to do is grace. The unmerited, undeserved, unearned divine favor of the living God. Amen. Oh, what a beautiful word grace is to the Christian. And look at the location of this grace. It is in or found in and and union with, if you will, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 1, 17, it says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So this command, Timothy, be strong. That command in the 21st century is to us as well. Be strong in a world that is falling well, not falling apart, really is falling into place. Amen? A, a world, be strong in a world that doesn't have any strength. Be strong in a world that is filled with fear and uncertainty. A, a, a world that literally, um, our nation, for example, a, a nation that has lost its spiritual compass. Amen? He says, Timothy, you've got to be strong and we need to be strong. Empowerment for ministry. Empowerment for serving. Empowerment for forgiving. For, matter of fact, to do anything for Jesus Christ, it is all founded upon the grace that has been given unto us. Amen? And how we need that. We're not to do anything in our own strength because our strength is not very good. Amen? And so he tells Timothy that. Listen to me now. Grace is more than justification. It's more than salvation. It's more than sanctification. Grace is more than pardon. Thank God for that. Grace, God's grace is power toward us. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 5, 2, that we stand in the grace of God. You do 24-7. Whatever you need, God's grace can do it. Is God's grace unlimited? Absolutely. Everything we need is in grace. And Paul says here, Timothy, you've got to stay. You've got to keep yourself right there in that kind of grace. And how is he to do it? How are we to do it? How do we do anything uh, when it comes to the Word of God? Faith. Thank you. We have to believe the promises of God. We have to know that God's commandments are always our enablements. Amen? The Bible tells us that we appropriate everything in the Word of God by faith. The Bible, matter of fact, faith, Hebrews 11 6, is the only thing that pleases God. And so, without faith, it's impossible to please him, Scripture says. So, whatever Timothy is going to be faced with, grace, there is enough grace to see him through. Whatever you're faced with in your life, what are you faced with right now? Or, or, or that area that you don't think is, you, you, there's, I don't have what I need to make it. No, you don't. But yes, you do. You have the grace of God. Amen? I mean, think about it. The unearned, undeserved unmerited divine favor of the only true God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, His grace rests on you right this minute. Right this minute. There's not one thing that God cannot supply in, in, in our lives. Amen?
And so here, you know, you say, well, Timothy, how, how's he going to do all that? By faith. One scholar writes this. He says, he says, there's nothing that can make, that can make us as strong as saying and believing, I'm a child of God in Christ Jesus. And I have, I have the love and the favor of God, even though I don't deserve it. This is the strength that comes by grace. You see, here's the problem. A, a lot of believers, they, they don't really understand grace. You know, if you don't understand grace, you will never truly understand the gospel. Amen? Not, listen, what Jesus did on the cross for the world, for us, Jesus said, it is finished. Listen, what Jesus did on the cross, God's grace is never going to change toward you. And his grace is unlimited. Where, where sin abound, abounds, grace much more abounded. Amen? Super abounded. And so we know if, uh, it's easy to say we're saved by grace, and thank God that we are. The Bible tells us a lot about grace. It tells us that we should um, be strong in grace uh, and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second Peter 3.18. That's the last words from Peter. He said, boy, be strong. Get that knowledge into you about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? If we have a need, where do we run to? Where does a believer run to whenever we have a need in our life? The throne of grace. Is there any accusations against you at the throne of grace? No. Have they all been paid for? Yeah. Yes. And you're invited to come. He says to come boldly. That means with confidence, with assurance, with freedom. Come boldly to the throne of grace. The, the place where you can obtain mercy, help, and grace in time of need. Or literally when you need it. How do you get that? How do you get what you need? Will you believe that God's word is true? Amen. Amen. So that's what we need to do. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1.13 about grace. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, <clears throat> be sober, and rest or set your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation or the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, you must believe and walk in and appropriate that you have that God-centered grace to do the job that you need to do. Listen, Timothy, can, could Timothy live the Christian life in his own strength? No. Can we? Absolutely not. What did Jesus say, tell us? He said, without me, John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. And I always like to say, look up that word nothing. And you know what it means? Nothing. That's right. Nothing. That means you need him for absolutely everything. Paul the Apostle <clears throat> told the church at Philippi, he said in Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. That strength is always in Christ. What did he tell the church uh, there at Ephesus? He said in Ephesians 6.10, he says, finally, brethren, he says, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, because the power of his might is absolutely unlimited. And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we think or ask according to the what? The power that works in us. Loved one, we have everything that we need. Grace, the power of grace. I thank God that we have that this morning. I'm so sorry you have to forgive me about that. I, you know what I think happened to you? Would you like me to tell you? <laughs> no, I'm not. I haven't had an allergy issue for a long time, but boy, it just hit me in that first service. It's because I think I'm allergic to sheep. I don't, I don't really know, <clears throat> but it's really getting to me, you know. Now, the Bible tells us, we learned in 2 Timothy, uh, in chapter 1, I think it was verse 8, and it talks about how God called us and how God saved us, not according to our own works. Oh, no, but how did he call us? He said, God called us according to his own purpose. Here it comes. And the grace that was given to us, given, it's a gift, given unto us, bestowed upon us, lavishly bestowed upon us, the gift that was given to us, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
You know, the, Paul the Apostle is telling Timothy, he says, you know what, Timothy, the same grace that you're walking in right now is the same grace that made me who I am. Let me give you that scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He says, but by, Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And you know what? Every one of us can say the same thing. Amen? It's by God's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't in vain. It wasn't empty. It worked. He says, but I labored more abundantly than they all, meaning all the other apostles. He says, I labored more abundantly than they all. Now, listen to what he says. It, yet not I. I didn't do the laboring. Here it comes. But the grace of God which was with me. That's the grace of God that was with me. The grace of God is with you right now. Listen, Paul suffered more, worked harder, and, and more than any of the other apostles. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Amen? Listen, Paul knew it wasn't his power. He knew it was God's grace. Now, listen carefully. Satan doesn't want you to be strong in grace. He doesn't want you to be a student of God's grace. Satan wants you to have a legalistic mindset. You know, he wants you to, actually, he wants you to live in, he doesn't care if you believe in grace, but he wants you to live in a sphere in your life, in your walk, that's outside of the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God, even though you have it. See, what he wants you to do, he loves for Christians to have a, instead of a living uh, fellowship with the Lord, relationship, he wants you to have a legal relationship. In, in, in other words, he knows if you have a legal relationship with God, he knows that you're going to live a defeated life. Amen? Because, see, you don't, what happens is, is that, that you turn to some, if you're not going to operate in grace, you're going to operate in something else. Well, I'm going to keep, I'm going to be good. I'm going to do this. Well, you can't do that without grace. As a matter of fact, you can't do anything without God's grace if you're a Christian. Amen? Yeah. And, and so the fact of the matter is, is that I don't know about you, but a set of rules just doesn't work. How much power does your rules have? Anybody made a New Year's resolution? Huh? Come on. You know, I mean, we can make all the rules we want, but it, there's no power in our human rules. But man, when you obey God's rules, there's where the power is. Amen? And Satan doesn't want that at all. And you know, one of the problems is, is many believers, you know why they're not strong and they're hindered to being strong? The main reason is this, is that because they are never, ever convicted of their own weakness. Never. They're ne Listen, have you gotten to a point in your life where you realize that you can absolutely do nothing without him? Nothing. Whenever that we, when we are weak, he is strong. Boy, he loves to work in weak people, fragile people, people that just said, Lord, I can't do it without you. I can't do a thing without you. And I tell you what, loved one, that's, what, that's exactly where we should be living. We have an incredible gift called grace. We can't earn it. And we have a strength that cannot be measured. Is there anyone capable of measuring the strength and power of God? No. Is there anyone, anyone able to measure the grace of God? No, God's grace is absolutely unlimited. Calvin said this about grace. He said, Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to destroy when it comes to the grace of God. Boy, that's a true word. Listen, he goes on and he says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Now, what are the things that Timothy heard from Paul? Are you ready for this? This is Paul's last letter, so that means that Timothy heard two-thirds of the New Testament from Paul and was taught it. Amen? So, Ben, that, that's what you call quite a lot. And so now Paul is going to do something. He says, Timothy, for all these years, in my last letter, I'm, I'm writing to you now. He says, I have poured my life and the Word of God into you. Now, Timothy, it's your turn. You're going to have to do the things that I did to others. And that's why he says, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So, Timothy, 
You're more than a pastor. Now you're a steward. And, and the things, the word commit means to entrust like the deposit. And we know that the deposit is the good news of Jesus Christ or the, or the gospel. And so what does Paul do? He says, Timothy, I'm giving you two qualifications as you look out among the sheep. He says the first qualification is this, is their character. They have to be faithful men, meaning committed men, reliable men. And the second characteristic is that they uh, are able or learn to be able to teach, meaning that is a gift of the Spirit, amen, to be a pastor, teacher, and so forth. So the ability to labor in God's Word. The ability to study God's Word, the, the ability to teach God's Word, it doesn't come from human strength. It comes from God's grace. Amen? You know, the Bible says, remember what it says when Jesus, the He who descended also ascended, and as He did, He gave gifts unto men, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 and following. And He, and he says, and one of the gifts that He gave was pastor-teacher. Amen? So that's a gift from God. And, and it's, it's not something that without that you have no grace, you have no power. So, Timothy, here's the deal. I'm entrusting this to you. Now I want you to reproduce others. And that's really the true way it should be done in the church. Amen? Is that reproduction? The ministry of multiplication where you pour the Word of God into other people and so forth. So he says, I'm passing the torch on to you. Now, question. Even though now he has all the grace that is needed, how is Timothy or any of us, how can we ever fulfill the mission from Paul to Timothy that is now being passed on to him? So here's what Paul does. He gives us, he gave Timothy three imperatives or three commands and then followed with three illustrations. Let's look at the first one. The first one is this. Timothy is to battle like a soldier. Look at verse 3. You therefore must, not an option, Timothy, you have to do this. You must endure, or literally, you must suffer hardship as a what kind of soldier? A good soldier of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our commanding officer. Amen? And we're all in the army. We're all in his army. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that, did you know the Lord is a man of war? Revelation 19.11, it says, and with justice and truth, he wages war. Listen, Jesus is going to come back at the second coming. You understand? Oh, loved one, listen. He says right here, he says, you are a soldier. Be brave. Endure hardship. Timothy was in a spiritual battle, and we are in a spiritual battle, aren't we? And the only way that we're going to ever operate in this world is through the strength of the, of the Lord. You know, uh, and be a good soldier. Are you a good soldier of Christ? I think there might be a lot of us are AWOL. Is that an army term, right? I've been out so long, I don't want to know what it means. A, or how about a POW? That's prisoner of war. You know, it says be a good soldier. I, I don't know if you, I'm a veteran. I served in the armed forces many years ago before many of you were probably born. And, you know, the thing is, is that if you've ever been in the military, maybe the Marines, you know, or the Army, I don't know about those other two, but uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. You know, does a soldier give up his rights? You don't have any rights. When, when you raise your hand and you're sworn in, your civilian life is over. Do you understand? You're under military law now. You're not under civilian law. And not only that, you are to follow your commander. Whatever they tell you to do, that's what you do. Listen, I don't know if you know this or not, but every one of you this morning, you're just like Timothy. You're no different. You are on active duty right now. You're not on leave. You're on active duty. And you're not going to be on furlough, loved one, until you get to heaven. Amen? Matter of fact, you know, right this very moment, our, our present command, our present uh, assignment, where is it? Fort Worth. Where's our outpost? Camargo. Hallelujah. Camargo. Amen. Our orphanage is there. Listen, if you ever served in the military, you know the routine. You're sworn in at the AV station in Dallas. I don't know if they still do that or not. And I will never forget, that. man, listen, when I, and I left, it was in the 60s, and, and, uh, and they put you on a plane. And back then, you know, it was, well, never mind. I don't want to go into that. They did, it was a jet, though, okay? And so they, we flew from Dallas to El Paso, Fort Bliss, of course, the, where I took my basic training. And I'll never forget as long as I live the moment 
they, you know, they open the door, and we're, we have to walk out on the tarmac. There's not any of those fancy things. I forget what they're called now. You walk through so you don't get wet from the rain. And, and, and when I got on out the door and I looked at the tarmac, I, I saw such a kind-looking man with a Smokey the Bear hat. And there were yellow footprints painted on the asphalt. And he yelled, I mean, I can't do that with my throat. He yelled, put your feet in the yellow footprints now. He didn't say, hello, welcome. <laughs> do you understand? And, when, and I knew, not, and I, listen, I still, I still remember his name, Vandy Stevens. He was the meanest man I ever met in my life. Do you understand? I mean, I have nightmares still about this guy. You know, and there I knew the moment. I knew I was in trouble. What did they do? All of a sudden, you lose everything you have. How about your civilian clothes? Can you wear your civilian clothes? No. Aren't you glad that we're clothed with Christ? Amen? Yes. And they, you, boy, they box up your clothes, and what do you do? You have to mail them back home, and you pay for it. And then they, they give you that great haircut. You know, and they, and then that, you know, they let you go pick out your clothing. Would you like this color, this color? No. What did they do? You, what color was it? O D green, my favorite color. And then my drill sergeant, he was so loving, so tender, tucked me in bed at night. Listen, you're in the army. You do what you're told. And they can, in a moment's notice, they can ship you anywhere in the world without your consent, and they don't care who it affects. Do you know that? Yeah. Not only that, the moment that you're in the Army and you start learning what to do, how to be a soldier, do they issue you a weapon? Yes. And are you to learn that weapon, use that weapon, train with that weapon, clean that weapon? Yeah. Yes. Why? It well, defends. That's what you're going to protect your life with. Now, has God done the same thing? All, if, you're, if you're in God's army, does he give you any, anything to protect you? Of course he does. The angels of God are all around you. God is right there with you. The Holy Spirit is there. But he's also given you the entire armor of God. That you're to, you know, one of them, it says, take up the shield of faith by which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, the devil. Amen? You have everything you need, but you have to take it up. So you have all the armor of God. The Bible tells us we have other things. The weapon of our warfare, it says in, I think, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. Amen? We cast down lies with the, and we do it with the truth. James 4, 7, here's some military words. Submit unto God. The word submit, military. Here it comes. Military word. Resist the devil and he will, he'll, yeah, he'll run. It, actually, he will run in terror. Isn't that amazing? So you have everything you need. You have just like because you're a soldier in the army of God. And he says, and no one engaged in warfare, Timothy, and us as well, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, what does that mean? Boy, that's a, a scripture that has been abused. Some say, well, see, you're never to marry. You're, this means you never marry. You don't ha ever have children. All, you're sold out to the Lord. Well, you're sold out to the Lord. He's sold out to you, but that's not what it says. God says it's not good for man to be alone. Amen? So what he's saying is we're not of this world and the affairs of this life. We're not really concerned about that. We're concerned about the affairs of the life that we're going to. Amen? In other words, our home there in heaven. And so we're to carry out our duties. And I want you to look at the last part again. It says that we please him our Lord, who enlisted him as a soldier. Isn't that amazing? God enlisted you. In, you, you didn't have, you, you, so you didn't have any rights. You were drafted. Amen? But he didn't enlist you for, to serve and please him for three years or four years, however long they do today in the military. But you're a lifer. Do you understand? You're, you're not here for the short term. You are here for the whole term. And he says, our whole duty is one thing, is to please our Lord. Now watch this. He says in verse 5, he uses now the athlete. So, Timothy, you have to be and we have to be as dedicated as an athlete. Look at it. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned 
unless, unless what? Unless he competes according to the rules. So if you don't play by the rules, you know what? You don't get the crown. What are, what's the rule book? It's the Word of God, amen, the Bible that you have. Listen, being an athlete, you have to be dedicated to be an athlete, amen? You have to work, man. I mean, listen, I remember when I was uh, in, played football and sports and all that, and I love football, I love basketball. Uh, my coach, my football coach, his name was Herman Carbell. What a name. I didn't like him. He didn't like me. And here's what he, here's what, here's, here's was our motto. All, he says, all I want from you, three yards and a cloud of dust. Three yards and a cloud, on every down. So if you go three yards on every down, what happens? You, thank you, Mario, nobody else, they didn't get it. You make a first down. So what do you do? Three yards and a cloud of dust, Bill. Three yards and a cloud of dust. You know, even though he didn't like me, he didn't. I was the captain of the team back then. In the, uh, hello. But you know what's really wonderful? He was a, one of the greatest coaches. He worked you like a dog. You know, we didn't have uh, Keller back then, Keller, the, Keller, the true Keller Indians, okay, the original before there was any of this other stuff. We didn't have money for nice locker rooms. or we, we, Even our uniforms were back from the, like the 50s, okay? And we didn't have a workout place. You know what he did? We got these five-gallon ga like paint buckets, and, 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 and uh, he filled them full of concrete to, and then put a steel post between them. So you have this one and this one. That's what we worked out with. Oh, you want me to tell you some more? <laughs> he, and then as you were lifting that, he would come and jump on your stomach. I'm, no, I'm serious. But let me tell you what he did. He produced, and I'm so thankful to be a part of it, the winningest football team in the history of Keller. It was a great time to play football. But you see, the thing is, you've got to sacrifice. If you're an athlete, you're going you're to work out right. You're going to train right. Do you understand? And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen, you've got to practice. You have to be dedicated. You are running the only race that matters, Timothy. And we are only running the only race that matters. And the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, that we are to run this race that's set before us with endurance. Amen? Never giving up, being dedicated, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? Listen, we're running for a crown that doesn't ever fade away, an imperishable crown. Amen? Well, not, not the, the crowns that come today. The, you know, let me give you the scripture in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Paul says, oh, listen, do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. In other words, to make that prize yours. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. In other words, you're disciplined. You eat right and train right and all the rest. Now, they do it, meaning the Greek games is what he's talking about back then. He says they do it for a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. When is that going to, what is that crown? It's a reward running the race given to us at the Bema Seat of Christ. Amen? The, uh, the place of rewards. You know, we have to run it, but we do so by the grace of God. And not only that, you know, there's someone who wants to take your crown and steal your crown and knock it off your head. We know who that is. That's why Jesus, when he's writing there in the church in, in, in the book of Revelation, in Revelation, I think it's 311, he said, listen, hold fast, man. He says, see, he, well, let me just back up. He says, behold, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming suddenly. I'm coming without announcement. Hold fast. See that no one takes your crown. Now, look at the next example that he gives us. He's, Timothy is to work hard like a farmer. He says in verse 6, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops or the harvest, okay? Do farmers work hard? Yes. Oh, man, listen. Hard, farming is hard, hard work. Every time I tell my, my wife, Becky, I say, honey, you know, we're getting up in years. I mean, you know, we're nearly 50. And, and I say, 
And I say, you know, we're not getting any younger. Let's, let's just sell our home and maybe go way out into the country and buy us a little place and, and farm. And she always says, do you know how hard farming is? You know, it's, you, you, you can't just go on a vacation when you want. If you have animals, I grew up on the farm with my grandparents there in Keller. Listen, you know, when you have a farm and you, you can't, you have cattle, you have milk to milk the cows and all, you can't just leave. So, amen? So who's going to feed them? Who's going to take care of them? So, in other words, he's saying, listen, Timothy, farmers do something. Farmers feed the world, but they know how to do it. They know how to plant at the right time, sow at the right time, gather at the right time. And so do you. Timothy, listen, you need not to feed the world. You need to feed the, the lost, feed the, feed the sheep. Amen? That's what it's all about. He's, he's saying your pasture, you know, the place of your, of your labor, it's a spiritual field. And your labor, Timothy, you need to feed others. But first, you have to, par- be, uh, you have to first partake of it before you can give it out. Meaning this, I can't give anything to you. Pastor Timothy can't give anything to others unless he first goes and eats it. Amen? He has to partake. In other words, you have to, you can't uh, give the Word of God out if you don't feed on the Word of God, correct? And that's what he's saying. He said, he says, boy, you, you have to be a partaker of that. And he says, listen carefully now. Look what he says. Consider what I say about what he just said about the athlete and, and so forth, the form of the soldier. He said, consider what I say, Timothy. I want you to really think about this and digest it, he says, and may or literally, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. So Timothy was number one, and so are we. We have to battle like a soldier. Amen? In other words, we all have to fight the good fight of faith. The next one is we have to be a dedicated athlete because we're all running the race of faith. We're going home, loved one. And then it says the hardworking farmer, you got to work. Keep plowing, Timothy. Keep sowing the word of God. You know, Jesus told us about those who plow for the kingdom of God in Luke uh, 6, 42, I think it is. He says, he says, those who look back, those who put their hand to the plow and look back, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, there's nothing back there anymore. Your life is going forward with the Lord. Amen. And so he says this next command, verse 8, he says, remember that the Jesus Christ of the seed of David, that's King David, of course, Jesus the descendant who would sit upon the throne forever and ever. The seed of David <clears throat> was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, listen carefully. It says, remember that Jesus Christ. That's not correct. In the original writings, uh, for some reason, the translators added the word that. It shouldn't be there. They just added it. It, if you read it in the Greek, it would be, remember Jesus Christ. It's kind of like a war cry, isn't it? You know, remember the Alamo. Remember Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's saying right here. He says, remember that Jesus Christ, he is alive. He is present with you. He's present with us. Amen? Oh, I'm so thankful for that. We don't follow dead, a dead man. Listen, if you remove the resurrection of Jesus, is there any salvation? No, any forgiveness of sins? Is there any hope? Is there any grace? No. But Jesus is risen, just like he said. Amen. He says, for which I suffer, suffer trouble as a what? Evil doer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. You know, I told the early service, I said, Paul is in prison, of course, for teaching in preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, amen, that he's alive. That's the only way to be saved, the only name given under heaven. That's why he's in prison. That's why he's going to be executed. But when you, when you really look at this, let me a uh, question. Did Paul, was he, Paul uh, a celebrity? Was he like in the spotlight, you know, and did he live a glamorous life? No. He didn't. And he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen, I want you to really look at this scripture because it, it hurt me to even study it. And, and it, it, because I know that when Paul penned this, that 
I think it broke his heart because he was called something that he was not. And it, was, it really, that's Nero's uh, language, evildoer. He's in prison. I'm suffering these things as an evildoer. In the Greek, that word means a malefactor, you know, like the guys that were crucified uh, with Christ, uh, the thieves left on the right and left. So this word evildoer literally means, it, it conveys the idea of a person who is so depraved and so wicked and who is evil to the core. He used the word that Rome used against him. I'm suffering these things as an evildoer. That's the word they pinned on me, Timothy. Listen, Paul the Apostle was one of the godliest men that ever walked. Amen? And I just, I said, oh, Lord, I know that hurt him. And he says, here I am, Timothy. I'm in chains. I'm in prison. But he said, oh, the Word of God, it's not imprisoned. And the Word of God, it's not changed. No one, not any person, no matter what they do, no one can chain the living Word of God. Amen? You know why? It's alive. It's living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Isaiah 55, 11 says, when God sends out His Word, it never returns to Him void. Amen? It accomplishes whatever God says for the Word to do. It does. Now, with all that being said, no one can stop or imprison the living Word of God. Yet, it can. It can be chained. You know how? The pulpits of America. By watering down God's holy Word. By not preaching the truth in love. Amen? By not sharing the whole counsel of God. No, oh, and that's happening in our nation right now. You know, listen, the Bible, no book in the universe, no book in the world has been attacked as much as the Bible. It's been banned. It's been burned. It's been rejected. It's been mocked. And you know what? It's still here. And it will always be here for the Word of God is eternal. It's flowers of fade, but the Word of God endures forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Amen? forever and ever. He says, therefore, I endure all things, Timothy, for the sake of the elect, meaning those that are going to be coming to Christ. I endure the, what I'm going through. He says that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with or literally with the reward of eternal glory. Can you believe that? Paul's in prison. He says, hey, I suffer these things. And I, you know what? I, I have no regrets. And I do. The purpose is because of the elect. Remember what Paul told the church at Corinth? He says, and he says, listen, I have become all things to all men that I might save some. To the Jew, I became like the Jew. To those outside the law, I became like those outside the law. To those who are weak, I became weak that I might win them. Paul was the ultimate soul winner. And he says, I endure all these things for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of those that are lost. You take a good look at Paul. If, you, if all of a sudden we could go back to the first century and go into the Mamertine prison and there's a camera, we could look at Paul. You know what? You would look at his face and you see a man that was disfigured from the beatings that he endured. You would see a man whose back had been literally ripped to pieces three times by the Jews, his own countrymen shipwrecked, stoned, and left for dead. Amen? And he even said there, there what, remember, act, what was it, Acts 16, Paul and Silas in the dungeon, there, they had been beaten bloody, and then they were bent over and placed in stocks, and then they started singing a hymn at midnight. Oh, and all of a sudden the earthquake came. You know the story. If you looked at Paul, he would say this, like it says in Galatians chapter 6 at the very end, he says, let no one trouble me anymore, for I bear in my body the marks, the stigmata, the marks of my Lord Jesus Christ. Back then, the marks, they would brand you if you were a runaway or a criminal. And he's saying literally, you look at me, I am branded by Jesus, my Lord, meaning I am his doulos or I am his bondservant, I am his, I'm his slave. Boy, Paul was a great man of God. And he says, Timothy, listen carefully. This is a faithful saying. Faithful saying, verse 11. Faithful, meaning it's sure, it is certain, it's immutable, it's unchangeable. He says, if, for if we died with him, 
If we died with Jesus, we shall also live with Jesus. Amen? Why did Paul pen that? I know that people say, well, Bill, that was a hymn of the church back then. It could have been. There's nothing wrong with that. But why did he pen that? Paul's in the Mamertine prison. Why would he say what he just said? He, look at it again. This is a faithful saying. He's pinning it. He knows that any day uh, he's going to die. He says, if we died with him, if we died with Jesus, <laughs> Timothy, listen, we're going to also live with him. So let's interpret this text here historically. Let's go back to the first century. Are the Christians being slaughtered? Yes, absolutely. Now listen, see, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. That means we're not dead. Amen? We don't, we'll never die. J Jesus said that. Even though he says, I'm the, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believeth in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. Amen? Oh, listen. No, we died already with Jesus. That, if you're a believer, that is a fulfilled condition. Why? Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection and ascension, are we all a part of that? Uh, yes, Jesus died for me, but he also died as me. The same thing for you. So he says, listen, if we endure, meaning if we suffer, okay, if we go through persecution, if we go through hardship, if we endure, we shall also reign, and in the Greek it would go, we shall also reign as kings with Jesus. But if we deny, if we disown him, he will also deny us. See, a life that won't serve the Lord will never reign with the Lord. Paul writes to the Romans in 8, 18, he says, Hey, I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. It says those that deny him. You know, I encourage every believer if, if, uh, to have a library. And if you don't have this book in your library, you can probably get it online free now. I don't really know. But it's called Fox's Book of Martyrs, okay? In Paul's day, it, it, the word uh, meaning deny, disown, five million Christians were martyred. Five million. You know why? Because they refused to deny Jesus Christ. I look and I say, oh, Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 10, if anyone denies me before men, I'll deny them before my Father who is in heaven. But oh, I love this verse 13. It says, Paul says, if we, Timothy, church today, if we are faithless, if we're untrue to him, if we blow it, if we were not pleasing him, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Isn't that great? God cannot deny himself. God cannot deny what he is. He's bound by what he is. That means that he cannot by the smallest degree be any other thing than what he is. And our God is the faithful God. Amen. When we are faithless, when we are beat down, when we can't, when we take our eye off, off what we're supposed to, God says, I'm, the, I'm faithful. You might be running the wrong direction, but I still have my hold on you. And no one's going to steal you from me. I'll take you back. You're going to, you know, do you understand? It's by grace. God does all of those things. See, God's character is unchanging. Malachi 3, 6, uh, I, the Lord God, I do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob, you're not consumed, the Bible says. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, you are God. You are God. My God, you are the faithful God. He's our faithful God. Lamentations, he cries out in Lamentations and says in, in, in 323, I think it is, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God is so good. Amen. He's always so good. You know, the great missionary Hudson Taylor said, it is not by trying to be faithful, but in looking to the faithful one that we win victory. Amen. Listen, Sometimes you, you may be saying to yourself, or the devil will, might be saying to you, I'm not going to make it. I, I, I'm not going to make, heaven won't be, I want it to be, but I'm just not going to make it. Oh, listen to me. That's not from heaven. That's from hell. The Bible tells us, listen to me. Let me read it to you. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 3, 3. <clears throat> but the Lord is faithful. He is faithful who will establish you 
and guard you from the evil one. And not only that, it says, he who calls you, meaning God, is faithful who will also do it. Do what? He who began a good work in you will complete it until the very day of Christ Jesus. Amen? The very moment that you're home, God says, okay, it's complete now. Do you understand? See, God is the faithful God. When we are faithless, He remains faithful. What about our sin? 1 John 1, 9. It, the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, <clears throat> if we confess our sins, that He is what? Faithful and just to forgive our sins and to what else? Thank you. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. How faithful is God? You know how faithful he is? That when we were dead in trespasses and sins, when we didn't want him, when we loved the world and didn't know that we did love the world, when we didn't even, when we were numb to things of God, when we were without God, when we were without strength, Jesus died for us. Amen. You know how faithful God is? The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and following, that if we, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you believe, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Maybe you're here this morning. You want to know how faithful God is? He loves you and he wants to save you if you don't know him. So as our heads are bowed and no one looking around and every Christian praying, maybe you're here and you say, you know what? I'm not a believer. I have religion, but I don't have relationship. I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want to be forgiven. I want heaven to be my home. I don't want hell. If you don't know Christ, you can right now. He's faithful. He says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe me, or he'll save you. Is that you? If it is, you don't have to get out of your chair. You don't have to come down to this altar. But you have to show one sign of faith, and that is just lift your hand and put it up and put it right back down and say, Bill, I want Christ as my Savior. I want to be born from above. I want my sins forgiven. Anyone this morning, if that's you, quickly put your hand up, put it right back down. Well, Father, I assume that all are born from above this morning. But maybe those that are listening live right now, if you're not, you have the opportunity. Just say, Jesus, be my Lord. Come into my heart. Forgive me, O Lord. I believe, and he will save you. Father, thank you that your grace is sufficient for us no matter what we're facing. And thank you, Lord, that we live in your grace 24-7, whether we feel it or not. And that, Lord, your grace, whatever we may face, there's enough there to, to get us through. I ask you, Lord, as the rain comes, we're so thankful for it. But, Lord, I pray that this dry ground let it not run off, but let it run in to the soil. And let there not be any flooding. But, Lord, I, we pray that you fill every reservoir, every lake. Oh, Lord, saturate our soil. Wash away this pollen and all the rest of this junk, Lord, like a cleansing. And, Lord, keep everyone safe. No floodwaters, we ask. In Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning, shall we? Listen, if you're here for the first time, first time visitor, there's a welcome center in the main lobby. They have a free gift uh, for you for, for uh, coming today, and they'd love to meet you as well. If you uh, need prayer, Jesse's going to close us out with song, and then there'll be people down at the front to pray for you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. And whenever the rain comes, I, I, like I told you earlier, didn't I tell you I was going to go outside? Or was that the first service? Well, I'm going outside in my bathing suit, in my backyard. I'm not going to, yeah, yeah, I don't want to scare anybody, you know. But, I mean, I want the rain, amen. I love you dearly. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you.
because you go home. God bless you.